It's September 21st, 2020. This is Rook. You know, for a people who carry as much pride as Iranians around the world, we are pretty good at making fun of ourselves. With all the heartache that people of Persian descent have endured across the decades, maybe comedy is an escape valve, a panacea, or a catharsis for weary souls. Enter our feature guest today, whose mission has been to spread positivity through his performances over the last 15 years. Max Amini has built a massive global following for his relaxed comedy and his witty improvisational skills, but he's also a serious business guy with a hardworking ethic and a drive to give all he can. Max Amini joins us today. This is Conversations from to and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gameshi. This is Rook. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Welcome to episode number 46 of Rook. Hi, Shaya. Hi, Jianja. Groovy Shaya. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. I cannot believe 46. I you cannot believe 46. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm proud of you and me and all the team. Yeah. yeah. Really? We do say that kind of with every episode. <laughs> 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 I can't believe it's 45. I can't believe it's 47. <laughs> But that's, yeah, it's true. 46 episodes. Mm -hmm. The little show that could. I, I, you know, I spent so much of the weekend talking about compensation and copyright and Persian creative content. So many people are just reaching out for me to me and, and talking to me. And then I went to this gathering and everybody just wanted to talk to me about the, um, because we ran Farid Zolan yes, last yes, week. Yes. Uh, and so much of that was, but this, this incredible, uh, in this case, it's an apt word, iconic Persian composer and songwriter who has been responsible for so much creative output but doesn't get the compensation, doesn't get the royalties because of the, the broken system that hasn't existed uh, when it comes to Persian culture and, and um, publishing. And so, a lot, and then on Thursday, we had Shah Nushi Parsipur, who is kind of in the same boat as a novelist who's yes. got these famous books and is living in basic, uh, you know, poverty in, in the United States, uh, asking folks for money and donations. So, it was it was a lot of the conversation that uh, I've been having with with people, and um, it's it's heartbreaking to talk about it over and over again. But also, I'm inspired to try and do something about this. You know? Yes, yes. You know, uh, this is my problem as a musician. I have always this problem, and after Farid Zolan episode, I need. I feel that okay. I need to do something because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's for me. It's very uh, uh, eye-opening. And yeah, yeah, you can't believe it's forty-six. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, Sharnish Parsipur was on on Thursday as part of an episode that we we dedicated to the memory of Navid uh, Afkari. Uh, and we had somebody on that show, uh, Hadi Qaimi, from the Center for Human Rights in Iran. And I just wanted to give a shout out to them because they do really important work in exposing yes. um, human rights violations and atrocities with respect to Iran uh, for the Iranian diaspora and beyond. Uh, you can find them at iranhumanrights.org if you're interested. And by all means, uh, if you haven't already, check out our last episode with Hadi Qaimi. Uh, Shah Nushi Parsipur and uh, Cyrus Narastea as well. Cyrus Narastea texted me and said that his film, Infidel, is the number one film in America right oh, now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, wow. I guess it's being, <laughs> a lot of people are seeing it. Uh, it's because yeah. it was released in the theaters. Great. Uh, yeah, so good for him. for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, are you ready for our guest today? Yes. Okay. 
Well, there are stars in the Iranian diaspora that are so well known among people of Iranian descent that you can just use their first name. As such, when I tell you that Max is our feature guest today, if you're a Persian person somewhere in the world, you pretty much know who I'm talking about. So prolific and ubiquitous has he been as a comedian, actor, television host, and personality that he's genuinely earned the designation of household name, despite still being a pretty young guy. So... Max, it is. Take a listen to this. One thing, a lot of the cool thing is, there's so many Iranians live in Los Angeles that actually other races are very familiar with our culture. Like, uh, you know, white guy, for example, like a lot of my white friends, like they, they've dated Persian girls. They're like, oh yeah, I dated this girl named Nulufar. <laughs> it's like, all right, cool. And they always have some shit to say. But you know, Middle East, <laughs> Middle Eastern woman, I'm gonna say this, Middle Eastern woman, they all have one thing in common, one thing. They all say this, when you meet a Middle Eastern or specifically a Persian girl, when you meet them, they all say the same line. I go, hi, uh, hi, where are you from, Persian? Nice to meet you. She's like, oh, I know, I am Persian. I am Persian, but I'm not a typical Persian girl. I swear I'm not a typical Persian. I'm very different. I am so different, you don't even know. I, I, I just, I'm not a typical Persian girl. And you're looking like, are you serious? <laughs> like you're wearing black head to toe, five pounds of makeup and a Gucci bag, <laughs> and the nose job? <laughs> no, no, this is not a nose job. This is not a nose job. See, I had breathing problem. <laughs> <laughs> Little taste of one of Max Amini's memorable early performances from back in 2011 at the Laugh Factory in Los Angeles. It has only been bigger and bigger from there. Max Amini is an Iranian-American performer who was born in Arizona, grew up in Washington, D.C., and did a degree in theater at UCLA. Over the last two decades, he has become a favorite of audiences around the world based on his impressive improvisational stand-up comedy shows, movies, and video Video clips. He appears to have tireless energy for touring the globe and also working as an interviewer on such programs as Minutes with Maximini on VOA and his newer interview documentary series, Das Dovad. As an actor, he has over 50 credits, including NBC's Heroes, regular appearances on Comedy Central's Mind of Mencia, and a leading role in the feature film Beyond Paradise, as well as a recurring role in the Netflix series Real Rob with Rob Schneider. Max has just finished a movie that he directed and produced and is about to drop a new comedy special. But first, right now, Max Amini joins me from Los Angeles, California today. Hello, sir. Hi, Gian. That's such a beautiful introduction that uh, I frankly am flattered to hear. You're frankly flattered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very, I'm very flattered, and and I, I, I didn't know when it's going to end. This is. I was like, wow. I is this really me? Because <laughs> it really was you. It sounds terrific. Yeah, you Thank don't you think so you deserve much. that? Uh, no, I just I, I I put this humble thing, uh, you know. I, I like to act humble, but deep inside, I really enjoyed every second of it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> you are every bit the diva they said you would be. Uh, yes, sir. You, you know, it, this is such a pleasure to get to do this with you. I wanted to do this for so long. How are you doing in the time of COVID? I I, I couldn't miss the fact that you had a world tour, Maximini World Tour 2020 <laughs> planned, which in retrospect mm. is, is dodgy timing. How how have you been dealing business-wise? I'm assuming you had to cancel a, a, most of your gigs. No, I'm, I'm touring empty theaters. Uh, every night I'm playing <laughs> these empty theaters. It's been a blast. Well, look, uh, COVID hit everybody uh, pretty significantly. Uh, as far as how I'm dealing with it, I, I, I feel like uh, I come from a background of a survivor, you know, a lot of immigrants, their background is it has designed them to to have a survival mentality, right. and I feel like I that's that's a part of my psyche, and I don't necessarily complain or sit and 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 wait to see what happens. I try to make the best out of every moment under any circumstances. And and in this situation, I feel exactly the same. Are you really, I'm, are you I'm really, really that balanced? Busy. 
You, in other words, when you find out that one of your big gigs is canceled or something, you don't even for an hour spend some time stewing or throw something at the wall, or, or you really go into that balanced place you just described? I don't know if it's balanced. It's again, I think it's a survival moment. You just go, what do I need to do? And you go in this, you go into this mode of I need to. You actually, I, I put a lot of thought into it. I, okay, what? How can we regroup right now? Uh, because I, I have a production company. I have nine other employees that are dependent on me, right. and th- there is a responsibility that it, you know to do a world tour. Obviously, I can't do it by myself. So there's a lot of people involved, and right. and I w- when COVID happened, just to tell you, you know, on the you know, we had no nobody knew how long this is going to be. So we just thought, okay, let's cancel the shows for the next month, month and a half. And then um, when we realized this is going to be a, a, a long time coming, I, I completely regrouped and I said, you know, we're going to heavily start focusing on production. And that really helped us. And so to answer that question, you know, is, is we, we just regrouped and we figured out what else can we do to make the best out of this situation and feel like maybe something else can come out of it. You know, I, I wonder how you deal with things financially. You're absolutely right. I mean, I, for for anyone who's been in this business or the business of entertainment or communications or what, would, would even be able to see you from afar and say, well, it's just this guy is, he's the talent and he might be running the show even, but it takes a little village, a small village to, to make this all happen. Somebody's got to book the gig. Somebody has to do the sound. Somebody has to yeah. uh, make sure the tickets are paid. Somebody has to, somebody has to do the lights, whatever. And so you have this team and, and uh, for, for you, I mean, the, a, a major source of your, your revenue, you has to be the live gigs where uh, you, you know you're taking the box office and 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 you're paying for your infrastructure so do you, are you someone who uh, I mean I can't imagine you've done so well that maybe you have a big nest egg and this is none of this matters but do, are you someone who gets worried financially in a situation like this kind of freaks out and goes wait a second how am I gonna keep my employees I'm so rich Gian money is never an issue <laughs> <laughs> you know, financially, I, you know, I, I, I speak for myself. The whole world got hit, and we got hit probably uh, harder than I've ever remember in my adulthood being hit. Because not only we had to cancel shows, we had to return ticket sales, all the money that we had from ticket sales, and my staff had to. You know, these guys have kids; they have families. Right. So I, I uh, solely. Um, uh, depended on uh, loans. So the the government loans is what what kind of has held us up so far. We're not we're not you are we kind, don't have an you income. are kind of rich though, right? No, you, really. You joke uh, about it, but you probably do, you probably done really well. I, I understand why you say this though, because there is a saying. They say when there is money in your pocket, you think everybody else has has money in your pocket. I know Gian has a deep <laughs> oh, pocket. Oh please! So no, you definitely so don't know what you're talking about. My, there. <laughs> <laughs> I understand my. Th- well, look, I want. I, I'm not. I'm not going to be one of those Persian guys who goes, "Buddy, I don't have any money. What are you talking? Buddy, Bloody. nothing." And then and then you go to the guys. He's got five Ferraris lined up. He's got you know a massive mansion yeah. with golden yeah. lions in the corner. No, but but frankly, you know, I'm grateful. I've worked really hard the last ten years touring. I mean, I can I can survive. I tell you that. But that's not the idea. The idea when we when we're speaking business, we have a you know we have a payroll, we have overhead. We just want to make sure we don't sink. But you know, I'm very at the same time positive about the whole thing. I'm really optimistic and i kind of feel like the universe uh, has a reset button and somebody pressed that button That's and sure. all yeah. of us all of us one way or another are resetting our minds and body and soul and going through changes by the way when you say no one knew there's a there's a, a video online of, of a live gig you did in san san jose i can only imagine it was uh january or february because it's from 2020 yeah and you're, yeah. you're making jokes about COVID. <laughs> like you're you're saying yeah. as long as you don't go to iran you're fine and everybody's like ah, yeah. ha, 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 you know <laughs> so it's yeah it's kind of uh, it's crazy yeah dude yeah. And, and the comments i'm getting since as if as if that video that video uh is from the beginning of COVID. we never no one ever really thought it's just, it's going to be like this this is from when even cdc announced that you don't need to wear masks this is how 
uh, this is how much you know lack of information was out there so i say on and literally I, I was i was making fun of masks on stage now here we go like literally around the corner we're all masked up and yeah. and people are writing what do you know asshole for saying you don't need to wear masks and i'm here going like look at the date on the video <laughs> right. but <laughs> right right oh, my when, and when you say that you go into survivor mode so when your instagram gets hacked what's uh what what's the first thing that you do do you do you swear or do you go what's going on do you get freaked out or do you uh, tell me what happened this was just like a couple of weeks ago right yeah yeah well first of all you're a terrific host ah. you are a terrific you, we're you're barely so good into at the you, interview no, we're barely no, no, really <laughs> you're so good at what you do because i do a lot of interviews and people uh, people frankly spend like such little time preparing for their for their interviews and and i'm flattered that, that you know that I my account was even hacked uh, recently. So, um, in, 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 Gian, I answer your question this way. I think um, this is my my personality. When when a disaster happens, when something when, when something happens, I tend to get super calm and and breathe, and I go into this. I I really try not to panic. Uh, it doesn't mean that inside I'm not feeling a turmoil. But uh, since I was much younger, I remember dealing with things this way. If I hear somebody passed away, if I get into a car accident, if uh, if something bad happens, I tend to get extremely calm, breathe, and, and my eyes. I, I'm just watching. I'm looking. And I'm, I'm, I'm really tr- – I, I immediately go into this zone of like, okay, um, what do I do? What do I do? Uh, what's the most important right now? How do I deal with this? Where did you and learn that's, that? I'm just trouble. And my father taught me this. Oh. Uh, my dad, I remember, I don't know how old I was, but I was pretty young. I want to say 11, 12 years old. And I think there was a car accident or something happened. And my dad said, when people get scared and they panic, nothing good will come out of that. So that's when you show what you're made of and you stay calm and you figure out the problem. And for some reason, that resonated with me so much and has come to my rescue all my life. So, you know, my sister got into a car accident. I I got into a car accident or so many bad things that, you know, daily stuff that happens to all of us. You know, I I have been able to extremely, um, uh, you know, kind of just like collect myself and fight with that fear and that panic and breathe and, and just go, what do I need to do to solve this problem? And I, I go into that zone. That's, it's amazing. So, it's, it's amazing that you can do that. Uh, and your Instagram is fine now. The world can rest. Yeah, well, uh, everybody yeah. can feel okay that uh, you got hacked, but you, you figured it out, right? Yeah, they told me I'm hacked. I took a deep breath. I threw my phone to the wall, <laughs> shattered it. and uh, <laughs> You know, but when we talk about bad things and <sighs> disasters happening, let me zoom out and go on a go go with that on a macro level. Uh, and I, and I want to ask the question about whether humor, which is part of your bread and butter, uh, can always be a panacea or are there times when it just won't work? You know, comedy is such a an essential uh, release valve for most people and cultures, uh, maybe especially the case with Iranians. And yet the global Iranian community, Max, as you know, has been through so much sadness, so much heartbreak in, in the last year alone. Even recently, the execution of a champion yes. young wrestler, ongoing human rights violations back in Iran. Uh, you know, I remember John Stewart struggling to find something funny to say after 9-11. Do you ever get to the point where you think, there are people being shot in the streets for being for protesting in Iran. I just cannot be funny today. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I think it's it's absolutely uh, human. Um, and, and there is something about every artist that they need to be extremely aware, um, self aware, and emotionally mature. And I think uh, timing is everything. When something like uh, a death of a you know Iranian wrestler, when you know it's, it's a tragic event and it happens, there is there is no comedy there, and 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 um, I, I think that's where I come. I I think we, you know uh, 
Where do I stand with this issue? What's my responsibility? And what's the balance approach? And it's a lot of time, it's very hard to figure out what's the ba- like Because you don't want to be uh, too hot-headed and you don't want to be too numb. Uh, there is a balance with social uh, tragedies that we are responsible for, and and to find that, I think that's that's um, that's something that we all well, learn. Well, also, I can only imagine that you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. For a, to a certain extent, if you have a gig, you're playing to five, ten, two thousand people in in and wherever on the night of something horrible happening that the community all knows about. If you get up there and just do, uh, you know, funny jokes, somebody somebody might say, well. Dude, are you that uh, unaware of what's happening in the world? But on the other hand, if you get up there and and seriously start t- talking about these issues, people might say, "I paid fifty bucks to come here to laugh. What are you doing?" <laughs> right? Exactly. So, so how do do exactly. you have some kind of mission statement? Do you how do you how would you approach that? If tonight were the gig and the the atrocities have happened this morning, what what how do you approach it? I tell you, first of all, um, I. I decide, I sit down and I think deeply what's the right thing to do. And if the right thing to do is to get on stage and perform, and I know it's going to have a backlash of uh, thousands of people, if that's the right thing to do, based on all the thoughts and and breakdown of the situation that that I've made, um, I'll go on that stage and I'll, I'll, I'll perform. And vice versa, if, if 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 I decide to cancel because of a reason and thousands of people are mad because of it, um, I'll stand by my decision. But I tell you, Jean, I really, really uh, dig deep to know what the right thing is, to, like what's the right thing to do. When I was in Germany this January, they had shot the, uh, Ira- the, the Iranian the plane, plane yeah. where 176 people died. Yeah. That, that uh, couple of nights later... I was performing um, in Hamburg, and it was a very tough, tough day uh, on social media. It was a very difficult. It was just, it was just difficult in every scenario you can imagine. So the, the social media, uh, the messages are going around, and everybody's so sad. I personally posted uh, because it was, it was really devastating what happened and outrageous. Yeah. So, and, what, so what do you do at, in Hamburg that night? So now I'm in Hamburg. I'm in Germany. We have a thousand people who purchase tickets and they want to come see the show. Now, the reality here is this. The reality of this whole situation is we're not celebrating anything. We're in another country and there is nothing we could have done physically. And it wasn't a t- like I thought about every aspect of this and I realized what I should do is I should do the show honor these people who are actually really sad right now and i can i can bring some joy to their life i can honor their ticket sales i can i can show up do my show but at the same time i will definitely dedicate a time to what has happened address and really connect to people and take that message and send it out on social media so people on the other side, they know, all Iranians, no matter where we are and what we're doing, we are thinking about you. And that message was, in my opinion at the time, it was going to be a very strong message to send. And that's what I did, and that was the outcome. Um, People, you know, really, I think genuineness travels um, pretty strongly, yeah. it resonates with people. People know when when you're genuine or you're just. But as you, know. you as you know as well, though, I mean, it sounds like you did a masterful job of trying to figure out what to do there in that situation. But as you know, uh, the byproduct of all this heartache, of all this trauma, of all the the atrocities, of all the difficult things that have happened to the to Iranians and and uh, to the Iranian community around the world over the last uh, year, let alone the last few decades. The byproduct is there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of people 
who um, have a have taken a position politically or with some you know ideology or some idea. Do you get that? I'm, I, do you get people saying to you, Max, you're not being hard enough on the regime, or Max, you should be hosting Reza Shah, or Max, you should be doing this? I, I don't know. Are you constantly hearing that, or have they? Has everyone come to the understanding that you're a comedian, you're not Amnesty International, you can't do it all yourself, and so they'll let you be? I, I think everybody, uh, everyone is dealing, every celebrity, every public figure is d- deals with the same uh, backlash or same pressure, I would say. But the bottom line is everyone should have a, a philosophy that they live their life by. And the more clear that mentality, that philosophy, that that life um, uh, journey that you have chosen, the more clear that path is, then the the more appropriate you behave based on what you stand for and what you don't stand for. Um, I have made a very strong decision early on in my life that I don't like to be a political figure. I don't like politics. It's I don't remotely resonate to politics as a as a self um, uh, speaking type of personality. I don't want to go out there and and, and and preach to the world, you know, or take a side and, and and be a political person. I find politics dirty, and I decided that I want to be uh, an artist that would like to stand for humanity, uh, not politics. So when when there is an issue i kind of that's where my so i go these are my beliefs and then when something happens i kind of put it through these filters and i go okay uh where do i stand with this and if something is is i feel like you know for the sake of humanity i need to voice something here i just voice that and i don't people i don't tell people what to do i don't tell i don't tell uh, I don't want to say, a, you know, vote for me to be the next leader and change the world. I don't think I can, you know, uh, I just want to do what I am signed up to do in this lifetime, what I think is my calling. You're an American. And I want to focus on that. You're an American in a pretty polarizing election year. Are you taking a public position on that? Absolutely not. You're not? Absolutely not. No. Uh, this, again, I I have my personal politics that... Um, you know, I, everybody has some sort of understanding. But as far as far as social um, coming out to public and wanting to be a voice, um, you know, publicly uh, on politics, I, I am. I don't want to take any. I don't want to be. I don't want to. I don't want that in my life gotcha. because I feel like what. In, again, some people could hundred percent disagree with me, and and that's that's their opinion. But what I think. It's it's valuable for me here is when I stay away from politics um, and I, I I'm a comedian who goes on stage and talks about family matters. Uh, I talk about social topics that are, you know, whether it's relationship, whether it's uh, observational humor. When I deliver my comedy, uh, everybody comes under that roof and enjoys that show. And that is so vital to our to, to our to our lives. People need uh, entertainment. People need to come out and laugh. People need to come and hear somebody's perspective on other things. And and I leave the politics to those who are good at it, to those who they feel like that's their passion in life. It's not my passion. So uh, by doing so, I have this wonderful gift that I can that I can give to people that they can they can come you know at least enjoy me and and they don't have to worry about. The whole, you know, uh, show turning. You know, to you know what's powerful about what the, what you just did there is that um, uh, because there's a, there, obviously there is a pushback. There's people from either uh, side of the American uh, uh, polarized divide right now would say, "How dare you not speak out against Trump?" Or don't you realize that uh, voting for the incumbent will be better for Iran or whatever they're going to they're say? The reason they may not do that is the clarity of your thought. It's quite impressive. You had you had the answer right away. Absolutely not. You know, and you're living by your own words, which you say we should all have our own personal mission statement of of who we're going to be and what we're going to stand for you talked about your early years max and and knowing from your early years that you didn't want to be political that you don't have a a taste for that um let's go there you were born in tucson arizona uh 
a hotbed of Persian activity. <laughs> how do you? Yes. How do you? I know you went to D.C. Then how do you describe your your earlier your early years as a kid with Iranian parents growing up in America in the 1980s? I was born in Tucson, I, and my parents were going to University of Arizona. Uh, my dad finished his, um, um, uh, he got two bachelors from University of Arizona, and then mo we moved to Washington, D.C., so uh, dad went to GW for his master's. When he finished his education, I was about, uh, uh, I was young, seven, eight years old, and, and my parents decided to move back to Iran. Yes. Because my grandfather's uh, wish for my dad was to, you know, educate himself, uh, you know, in the Western world and then come back and serve his country. So, so he, he wanted to make his dad pr proud of, at the time my grandfather had passed away, but my, my father, you know, wanted to do this. And so we moved back to Iran. But hang on after a second, the, before you go to Iran, Iran, before you go to yeah. Iran, do you, you're, you're, you're a kid in Tucson, in DC, basically, you said six years, yes, old, seven years. Yes, old. yes. Do you, are you, an American kid? How, how do you see yourself at that point? Very, very American. I mean, I didn't speak a word of Farsi. Um, you know, I, I, we grew up and we spoke English in the house, just like every other kid, you know, is born here. And, and now we moved to Iran <laughs> after the revolution. While everybody was right. escaping Iran, right. we were on a plane, we were on a plane to ourselves, I'm assuming, going to <laughs> Iran. Right. right. Like, it is an extraordinary sure? <laughs> inverse trajectory of most exactly. families. Yeah. You're, we, you're, we land into airport and they go, Are you sure you 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 know you want to come in? <laughs> like, yes, yes. We we are very sure. We're absolutely out of our minds. We uh, we can't find a better worse situation. So wait a number. second, wait a second. Yeah. Your dad, uh, your Esfahani dad, your mom is Azeri. By the way, so yes. is my mom is as well. So we've got that in common. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So, so, so your dad says to your mom, I've got to honor my dad, uh, my grandfather. i got to do, go do this. There's no pushback. There's no, honey, do you think this is the best time? There's a war. Uh, how, how simple was that decision for your parents? I think they were so naive to what they were doing. And and look, this is so early on. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I really. I mean, obviously, I was a kid. My mom wasn't fond of the idea, but my dad was extremely passionate, and he was a, he loved his country, and he thought he's he can do so much for the country, and he's going to go come back. And I don't know if they thought. I don't know, honestly. So where did you thought. go? You, Tehran. Tehran, and we we start. You know, they put us in school, and we were a little behind because, uh, you know, we didn't speak Farsi and. They put us in school, and, and I was, you know, the dumbest kid in school. Well, I, not I mean, how <laughs> does, <laughs> this is the golden question. I mean, how does young American Max deal with being thrown into this situation in, in post-revolutionary Iran as a seven, eight-year-old? You just, you don't, you know, we didn't know any better. We just, <clears throat> our parents didn't know any better. I remember my mom had a really hard time adjusting. Um, because my mom grew up in London from age of 13. She was in boarding school at age 13. So she, she didn't, she was a, it was a culture shock for her. I remember my, you know, my grandparents loved it. Her parents were so happy that we were all there. The family, you know, the, the, what's beautiful about Iranian culture is the family, they're all around you. They're, yeah. you know, so all of that was wonderful. Um, you know, and, 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 and you just, you just, I, I don't know, but you just figure, like, I remember being in school and, uh, they would line us up and, you know, before, before you go to class, it's like a military thing. Like everybody lines up and they, they, you know, they, they have these, they, they, they scream death to America uh, death to Iraq. It was it was a the war kids between do? Iran and Iraq. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. just like a military yeah. death to America. And I, and I remember standing in that line in Farsi. The, all the kids say death to America, and I'm like, I was born. I'm American. So I went home and I told my mom, Mom, they they're saying death to America, but well, I, I can't say death to America. And my mom said, "Yeah, don't say it. Just just mouth it. So they, you know they think you're saying. What did my mom I mean, know? So, so one doesn't like, know whether to laugh or cry, of course. But th yeah, that's horrible. Was, so yeah, so, it, what did the other kids make of you? Did you? I mean, were you? I got bullied a lot. I really did. I got bullied a lot because I looked privileged. I didn't look belong to the to the thing. I and, and I'm telling you, my Farsi wasn't good." So I'm sitting in class. I can't understand what the teacher was fully saying. It took me a, 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 almost a year 
to get to to if just get that language barrier out of the way and then i kind of started like maybe making a few friends here and there but it was t- tough I, I honestly remember all the way t- till age nine nine or so it was really hard for me to fit in i had very few friends and the friends were like friends of the family type of thing and and so the first couple of years was really tough but then you know you, you just you get your kid and you, you know you figure it out and and uh you know it just i mean you know the, 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 the cliche by. the cliche question to ask a comedian is uh were you funny when you're six years old i mean i i, I don't even know if you would have the, you're not exactly was, in the conditions where you could be I like was. a rabbi walks into a bar <laughs> like no, but, but i tell you what i was crazy i was a nutcase okay and, and, and to this day the whole family you know when they tell me the stupid shit i did when i was you know <laughs> as a six-year-old in iran like i I would take a kubida and go to. I mean, the stuff I've done it was so outrageously. What stupid. would you do with the kubida? What, what were you going to say? Yeah, I, I would take a kubida. My cousins were telling me these stories, and, and you know when they put the sikh in the kubida, <laughs> yes. uh, there's a hole in the middle. So apparently, I would take the kubida in front of the whole family, and I had this obsession with t- turning it into a telescope and go, "Oh, I can see through the kubida." So I would have the kubida, the kid. <laughs> wouldn't stop taking the kubida and like looking through the kubida and everybody goes, oh, I can see you through it. So I was just obnoxious and, and, and uh, you know, so. <laughs> but, so you know, you, but um, so you didn't hate the, those first couple of years in your own? You, you somehow, I mean, you had the family love, but it's really tough for a kid. I mean, I can't, if I think it if, was, for, if it, it were really me, tough. I'd be looking at my parents, going, "What did you? Where did you bring me? I want, you know, I was doing so well back in D.C. Uh, or you know, I mean, I had the opposite experience growing up in in England and being a you know a kid who was very Iranian and and sort of wondering why I didn't fit in there. But but this this is extraordinary. You get thrown into the yes, situation. It, so it's interesting you say that because no, I never. I I didn't grow up in that privileged uh, scenario to tell my parents, why did you bring me here? Let me tell you something. My parents were going through hell. And I think that's why we never thought about ourselves as kids, like me or my sisters. We never, you know, my, my parents had a, uh, a, a very complicated marriage. They were uh, not in a good place. We were in a new country. There was so much happening. I don't think as kids we uh, I, we even had like when I, I'm listening to what you're saying. No, I didn't didn't have this thing like, oh, mommy, why you brought me here? No, mommy was going through hell. Mm. And and as a, and as a son, I would see how my mom is having a hard time. And I, I just think we we were on autopilot, just getting up and dealing with the situation, going to school and dealing with it. I. I in school I didn't have a support system back then they would hit the kids uh, teachers would hit the kids uh, in school I remember uh, all the time getting punished because I either um, was dropped off late to school or I didn't um, you know understand what the teacher was teaching and you know they would just slap you or hit you with a stick or something. it was just literally sounds like a you know barbarian times yeah, but yeah. really it was uh, and and I'm telling you, it was a very brutal time of my life, uh, the the first two or three years. And then it, it's kind of it, it, things kind of shifted because you get used to things, you just accept things. Humans have this magnificent power to accept things, and and I just it became norm. And that's when I came to my senses. I started having more of a personality. I started fighting back with the bullies. I started uh, making more friends, playing sports, playing soccer, playing volleyball, playing basketball. And then I just, you know, at some point, I, you know, I became the tough kid myself. Mm. Believe it or not, you know, I stood up for myself. I got into a lot of fights. You know, we, there was a lot of fights after school. And, and eventually I learned to stand up for myself. And, and that's when things shifted and I became the alpha. Um, and yeah, and then and then we grew up in uh, in that environment, and you know, today, as a grown up, I can say uh, again, I, I always try to see the positive in things, and I'm grateful because I have a perspective that it's very, very unique. Um, sure. And, and I'm th- I'm very grateful for that. How did and, how and, would you say if you were to put it in a nutshell? Because obviously you come back to the U.S. and then you end up going to UCLA. How, how would you say those years in Iran changed you? 
I feel like it allows it allowed me it gave me the opportunity to relate to a lot of different kinds of people. So I understand what it's like to be a foreigner in that country. Then I became, uh, in, then then I melted in that society, became a part of the society, and then I came back to the state, and then I felt what it's like to be an immigrant in America, and then again because. I was born here, and English came back to me so fast, and the culture, etc. And, and then I, I understand, you know. So I, I feel like one of the reasons my comedy is very relatable is because I understand um, uh, people in, in ways that maybe a lot of people wouldn't be able to relate to, mm. and that that's what I'm grateful for. So you come back now. You're back in the U.S. Um, uh, how, how many years later do you, do you, how many years were you in Iran? I came back for high school. So okay. I, I was a, a sophomore in high school. So maybe five or six years in Iran, you come back. And, Seven, eight years. Yeah. Okay. And then you're, then you're, <laughs> you're, you're back sort of where you feel comfortable, but you've just come from this place. Um, is there an, an interesting or difficult reintegration to the West when you come back? Yes. hundred percent. You, you move from one state to another you have to get adjusted, let alone from a country to another country. Uh, you, you, you know, you leave your friends. You now in a new environment, um, and uh, you know the stories and the details are long. But just to give you the general aspect of it, of course, you know I was now in a new environment again, and I had to uh, again learn how to survive, and and how to adapt, and how to uh, learn the the culture and and the pop culture and the you know how people uh, maneuver and and so I made new friends and 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 um, that's why I'm telling you I feel like I totally understand how immigrants feel I got it, yeah and you know but Max when you left to when you left you were an American boy when you come back are you uh, Ethnically out of the closet, then are you? Uh, yes, you're, yes, you're yes, the, you're yes, now, yes. You're now you're now Iranian American, Max. You're per, you're yes. a Persian kid, yeah. Yes, and, absolutely. And what did that mean to you? I don't know, but you know, I, I kind of feel like I always felt uh, uh, it was I was always not quite the guy who like I, I didn't quite fit in when I was there. I didn't quite fit in when I was over here, um, but. You know, I tell you, I had a lot of identity crisis in my uh, teenagehood, and um, I dealt with a lot of not knowing what am I? Am I Iranian? Am I American? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I grew up in D.C. Am I black? Am I white? Mm -hmm. Am I Hispanic? <laughs> you know, my cousins are all half Spanish, half Persian. My aunts are my, my aunts are Latins, so they're but from the Latin descent. So, but you know, so all my cousins are half. And have you figured and this just, out yet? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, yes, I, I tell you what really helped, John. Okay, stand up comedy, um, acting. This this world really helped my identity crisis. Hmm. And and when I started doing stand up, I had to figure out who I am. And and that was the biggest gift I think this art form gave me. And I started talking about my family. And I was like, what part of this is truthful and what part of it is not truthful? And the more truthful and authentic my comedy became, the more successful I became as a comedian. And I realized that's what's special about comedy. You have to find the, the truth and you have to find the truth of who you are. All of this was the gift that yeah. I got from it. But, but uh, let me get to the comedy. But two steps back, first of all, because you come back, you love acting class. You want to go to uh, UCLA. You want to do theater. Uh, you you want to go into performance uh, by high school, let alone college. Uh, it's it, I mean, it's kind of an obligatory question <laughs> at this point when you're talking about Persian parents. But but I happen to know that your dad was not happy with this. You've said it before in interviews. How did he come around to you, or has he, or did they, to to you being uh, to go, going into the performing arts? Um, they were extremely supportive. Extremely, they, they were extremely. My oh, dad okay. So he wasn't reason, happy, but he was supportive. Uh, <laughs> no, dad was my dad. My father was very happy. Uh, let me just say, it's important I explain this because I moved out of my parents' house 
at an early age. I left my uh, father's house when I was 19, and I I was on my own. I, I made my own money. I paid my own way through college, um, and I had zero dependency on my family. Can I just say that's so, not an early age for white people? That's just an early age for Persians who expect yes. who stay at home till they're 40. <laughs> <laughs> that's the normal yeah, age kind of for Western. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I I had a family dynamic where we, uh, from age sixteen seventeen, I was working. I was making my own money. Okay. Um, and I I hardly I don't remember really asking my dad for money to be honest. I always worked, and and uh, because we had this, I had this independence. Uh, my my, we had a very you know I feel like my family dynamic is very different than many other Iranians, um, frankly. And and my dad had a really good talk. Like, look, my dad went. My dad was uh, the guy who went to school and got two ba- bachelors and 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 his masters and end up not doing anything to do with his studies. So then his advice to me was find a major that you love so much. That after you go to college, you take you you live that life for, you know for the remaining of your life. Just find a subject that you like so much that that will become your thing. Mm. And and I took his advice to heart. So when I went to community college, I started taking a lot of classes in different um, different um, uh, you know genres, and I found acting fascinating. And I was deciding between uh, uh, becoming a nutritionist or uh, becoming a an actor comedian a nutritionist so yeah i really enjoyed my nutrition okay. class and uh so i had this this struggle for the first uh, year in college do i want to you know which way do i want to go so finally uh, i was talking to my dad again and i told him listen i really madly i'm in love with my acting class whether i need to write uh you know a 30 page essay or i need to read uh, you know, three books. I, I it, it doesn't bother me. I enjoy every second of it, and and then I also like my nutrition class. So I decided to go into the acting world, and and Dad was extremely supportive because he said if you love it and you just you know you you promise me you go to college that'll make me really happy. I said for sure, um, and that was that was my destiny. You know, when you talk about comedy. Uh being your uh you okay you just drop something yes All just right. dropped the pen yeah okay <laughs> when you <laughs> microphone sensitive <laughs> when you talk about comedy being a being a salve a kind of a um a contributor an enabler in in terms of finding your identity i think about the fact that by the mid 2000s you, you start becoming a regular at the laugh factory the famous laugh factory in in, in hollywood um and I, I didn't see you perform i think until like 2010 and it was at the laugh factory and it was on persian night there was like some persian comedians oh, you know yeah. and, the, <laughs> and and you know but but if i think back to 2006 and you're already doing a a comedy tour with some fellow comedians called exotic imports the implication there is that you're talking about being exotic so from the beginning in your comedy it was about identity right it was about at least part of it about being an, an iranian kid Hundred percent, and and even uh, it was it was and is still a challenge for us to fit in the American society the way we want to fit in the way we want to be seen. Um, you know, all of all of Middle Eastern actors um, they don't want to be no, they don't want to be seen as terrorists and uh, the brown guy who who's cast as a, as a rug salesman in a TV show. Um, we all we all strive to you know that's I think that's the biggest battle that we're that we're against and that is uh, show who we are and find that positive aspect of the Middle Eastern culture and, and put that in the society. So it's it's been it's been a it's been a wonderful uh, challenge. And how would you characterize those early years for you? It, it as much as you, I know you work hard now. To be frank, I saw you last year, you know, we said, hi, George, you did the gig here in Toronto. You, sure. you know, when you're coming out and people have paid a lot of money to come see Max and Meany, it, it's, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna say you don't have to work hard, but, but, you know, they're primed to laugh. They're primed to be, to, they love you already. You don't have to win them over. 
at the Laugh Factory in 2006, without when you're not that well known, uh, and you're getting up there, it's uh, <laughs> you know it's it's more challenging. So uh, how how did you deal with that period? I think uh, deep down you believe you're good. If you believe you've got it in you, then you you just hang in there. You deal with all the struggles, and 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 you get better. Uh, every artist gets better with time and focus. You work really hard on your craft, and you have to be patient. And this this goes to any artist. And and that's when you gonna you, you get better and better, and you learn who you are. You learn how your soul, uh, you know, just it, it resonates with the world. And when you when you start understanding that, and you can't even put it into words, that's when you, as an artist, you develop a, a <clears throat> vibration. That when you when whether it's a, a painting or that that speaks to the to audiences or whether it's a speaker or an actor, that's when you resonate in in ways that the the words can't describe. So have you had that nights where you time. bombed? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. And how, many and, nights. And how was that? It, it's it's the worst feeling for for I mean one of the hardest form of performance is stand up comedy for that reason is is when you fall flat on your face it's it's just so hard you know you just you you you're really standing on on stage sweating bullets and 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 it's the worst feeling but uh you you walk off of that stage and again that voice inside you deep inside you says it's okay you you better than this you 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 can do it you can figure this out mm. so you feel terrible but you you just fight all the negative voices and you say you know what i got it i'm going to i'm going to be funny next time i'm going to figure this out and 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 you just keep doing it till till you f- and then every time you get a little better you feel it and and again it term, it comes with a lot of patience and time you know a very um a very famous uh, uh, interviewer once told me who I was. I had the. I you remember who Dick Cavett is. You know Dick Cavett is. Yeah, he's a very you know uh, from yester yesteryear, a famous uh, interviewer. And and I said, how do you deal with the the nights when you're uh, um, when you're not doing when you you know you do an interview it doesn't go so well? And he said, uh, you're only as good as your last gig. You know, so, yep. so, so it doesn't matter how good you've been, right? You know, night after night after night, if you suck, you just can't wait to get back on stage because the last, the lasting memory, if not for anybody else, for yourself is of that tough night that you just had, right? That's so true. You're only good as your last gig. That is, that is, that is a really honest statement. And, and I tell you, uh, let me just add something to that. Um, when you're growing up as a stand-up comedian, or again, any any art form that, you, that you're a part of, um, it comes a time that you figure out your voice, you figure out your style, and you figure out who you are. That's when you become bulletproof. That's when you become consistent. Um, I have a quote. I have this uh, folder in my phone that I write my own quotes. One of my favorite quotes that I've been that said, a pro is somebody who's consistent under pressure. Meaning, you know, a lot of times, like, you know, when I became a touring artist, mm-hmm. um, you know, I was pretty ready because I had already been doing stand-up for nine, ten years prior to that. It's not like it happened overnight. People saw me because they were seeing me then but nobody knew what happened before um, i get to that part so it was a lot of struggles and and finally when i found myself is when when i became you know i I was able uh, people were able to relate to me and i became successful so when i found that that voice everything changed and i think consistency becomes the number one um you know priority and challenge for an artist you have to be and when you say you're you're good as your last gig you you know you can't be inconsistent you know there's a lot of responsibility that comes you know that gets more complicated if what you're doing is improv on stage 
and you are known for uh, spontaneity on stage. I mean, I mean uh, yes. uh, you you pride yourself in that. This means improvisation. That means like Max goes up there and he, you know, you you you, you let the ball go where it goes. You, you follow the puck, as we say in Canada. Uh, improv is a tightrope. I mean, it can be a minefield. And tell me about having the confidence to know that you can rely on that spontaneity when you're on stage and people have paid a handsome price to see you. You're at a, you're at a fancy theater. You know, I mean, any guy who's been in a successful band or any person who's been will understand that, you know, it, with this, this feeling because you may want to go up there and, and jam, but the, the audience paid for the hits, right? So they're coming, yes. they're coming. Uh, okay, Maximini, give me the thing that I loved when I saw you 10 years. You're, you may be way over it, but you, but they, they, to a certain extent, they're coming to hear that funny joke that they remember or whatever it is, your, your famous bits, and you feel the confidence to go up there and do half a show that's going to be just improv. Tell me about that decision. It was, it's, it's a part of me. It's, it's a part of my blueprint. It's the best way I can say it. I, it's, I've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, I was in high school and I was a part of an improv troupe and I started improvising. Then I became a stand up uh, comedian in my early 20s. 23 years old, I started doing stand up. And I, I always improvised in my sets and it took a while to be able to find, again, t to be able to learn my voice and figure out how I'm going to play the moment and how there, there is there is an art to it there is a there is a um there is an understanding to know how far to go forward when to pull back when to go into material uh and 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 it's a dance and when you learn it then then again i i feel like that's that's where i say you become consistent so i don't go on stage and saying well let's see what happens it may f fail tonight i i am 100 percent confident that i'm i'm only i'm going to deliver every time okay so do you you go on stage with some nuggets that you know you're gonna you can fall back on or that you know yeah. you're going to close the yeah. show with but you also let things happen as they may right is that absolutely. The, it's that, it's that absolutely. combination absolutely absolutely you, you've said that you said a few moments ago you said something about being observational you've said you've called yourself an observational comedian and i thought that sounded really good but then i was thinking about it and i was thinking well that kind of speaks for itself everyone is observational what what is the delineation what are you trying to say by that I feel like I, you know, so people have different superpowers. Okay. And I, and I really mean it when I say this. Um, in the world of astrology, um, when when they look at your uh, human chart, uh, your human design, they can see what you're made of. So there are parts of your brain and your soul and your being that is that is stronger in different aspects of humanity, right? Uh, Everybody has, you know, different different personalities, different blueprints, different fingerprints, right? We're all, none of us are all exactly the same, but we have, we, we, you know, we share a lot of, you know, commonalities. So for me, the the sense, this the sense of looking at things and being able to read people's behavior, being able to relate to people, knowing how to play with that energy. Is something that I I discovered in me, and I allowed that to um, to 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 blossom by getting rid of the fear. Mm. When you know the fear was was the, was is what I needed to, to get to to uh, to, uh, to kind of beat out of the game because my subconscious does miracles when I'm on stage when I allow it to come to surface. And the only thing that becomes an obstacle between, uh, you know, that is fear. So when when you become confident enough in your craft and you understand how you function and you allow that functionality to blossom, that's when the magic happens. Okay, but you lost, and, and you lost me a little bit. You talked about sure. spirituality and astrology. Are you saying that your observational... Uh, sense superpower is comes from a spiritual place. Uh, no, I think okay, that sorry. my I think that my um, my just by design my human design mm. uh, improvisation 
is is a part of my design. I got that. And I got it's that. It's a strength. The observational yeah. part is is what you see things. You make notes. What 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 does it mean? Oh, when I look at an audience and I see a, a you know a couple sitting on row three, um, what I observe, the what I see is is something that is is that I, I you know you can't put into words mm. that's an observation that that's my way of looking at it you can you can put anybody else on stage before and after me they'll come and see the same couple they'll tell their own story right when i see something the way i observe it I believe that the strength that I have is to be able to relate to them and tell a story about it on the spot in a way that is that is entertaining. Again, not to turn it into something super complicated. It's just that there are other artists that do the same thing. And I think the reason they do it is because they also feel like they can look at things yes. and they can immediately tell a story about yes, it. Yes, yes. There, there is an observation that they have yes. that is worthy of a quick story. Uh, they can make something out of that situation. Not just that, but I think as an audience member, when the audience sees you doing the magic, you know, then th there's no prefab. It's not manufactured. The guy, you're seeing something, you're reacting to it, you're, you're saying something funny. It's the biggest win, right? Because the audience is going, wow, this guy just did that. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and, and so it's, uh, uh, I mean, the tightrope is that you, you've got to be funny. You've got to come up with something there. But uh, I, get, I get what you mean. You know, a lot of times I've watched my own comedy, um, right? And like we sit in our office and we pull the old footage and I, and I look at the the crowd work, and I watch myself, and I laugh, and I go, I don't know what the hell I came up with this thing, and and it's the magic of that moment. It's there's something about letting go in that moment and letting it create its own, and that that's the most uh, fascinating part for myself. I look back and I go, I, I can't, I don't even know, I, I have no idea where that came from. And a lot of people expect me to be funny at a dinner table or I go to a gathering and they just think, uh, the, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, there is, I need that stage and I go into a zone and that's the zone that, that it's so like to create that zone. That's what I think years of, um, experience on stage has given me to be able to tap into a place that, that brings a lot of interesting moments. Are you, uh, possessive? about your your jokes about your humor max you know uh, persian comedians or persian comedy as a genre it didn't really it's kind of like persian hip hop it, it didn't really exist yeah. 20 years ago so so what that means is that you and maz become especially maz but you as well become the grandfathers even though you're you're a young guy of this genre and now there's a bunch of comedians that, you know there's a bunch of people doing doing um, uh, persian american or, or you know, Iranian diaspora kind of comedy. Are you sensitive about somebody doing that kind of thing and doing jokes that are similar to yours? Or, or uh, is, there, is there the infrastructure, is there the culture within that Iranian comedy community where there's th that sort of possessiveness that I know can exist amongst other comedians? Mm. No, no, not at all. Uh, me, Ma is rock, also the same here. Way. Don't know. Hundred percent. Right. Hundred, okay. hundred I right. tell you, from the bottom of my heart, I'm extremely supportive to younger comics because I understand what a long, difficult journey it is. Nobody comes into this game right off the bat knowing who to be, how to be. They discover themselves. This is so important. Like this is really comedy. Comedy is discovering who you are, and it comes with time. So um, you know, a, a mature um, comedian. And, and look, I've learned from some of the other older comedians, not necessarily Persian, in the world of stand-up. Um, we support younger comedians. I, I, you know, it's not good for a comedian to steal somebody's joke verbatim. But I, I've there's so many Persian comedians that they, you know, came came into the game and left, and some still, and and they take jokes like you know in the in the realm of what you've said before and that's okay i support them because 
you know this is this is the only way we can become stronger in the in the in the community of comedy uh, 100% you know th- what i'm telling you is from the bottom of my heart and and i i i'm not possessive in that sense so many comedians sound like me when they first start sound like Moz. i know th- there's a couple of comics today still yeah. you know working and and it was funny as but but we don't say anything we allowed the kids to discover themselves and then they do and they're grateful later on and and so you never have a everybody. moment where you go come on this guy's doing what i was doing for, you know for, <laughs> I, <mean. laughs> I don't i don't i think a good artist uh Gian, i like to be uh, the bigger person uh-huh. uh, i like to i'm i'm striving to be a role model as much as i can for the younger generation so no Okay. I, I want to do the right thing. I, I started my, my stand-up comedy in Farsi because I want Iranian comedians in Iran to to become better and understand how stand-up really works. What is real stand-up comedy? I've talked about it online. I've you know I, I had a t- I had a little talk show many years ago called Minutes with Maximini. Yeah. And uh, stand-up comedy had just started like the very first time on the TV. They brought a couple of comics to do try try to do stand-up, and uh, I invited Moss to come on my uh, talk show, and I played clips of that TV show in Iran, and we gave them so much encouragement, and we talked about it, you know, because we want to see other comedians. Uh, come to the game and be incredible. There's room for so many, you know. Well, you led me there perfectly because by 2010, you set up something called Abstraction Media. And I know you've mm-hmm. been an advocate of helping out other Iranian artists. I, we actually had somebody on the show very recently uh, named Melissa Shoshahi. And she went mm-hmm. to great mm-hmm. lengths to talk about how one of the reasons she's actually even doing this is because you gave her the confidence to feel like she could try doing this, you know? Obviously, she's not at your level, but she's she's working at it. Do you, do you feel as though creators in general comedians artists creators in general, get enough support and respect in the in the persian community i know you and maz do and when you get to a certain status they love you <laughs> but, but, yeah. but before that point um talk to me about what you've learned about our community and and the place of of artists in it sure i think Xion, this is a you know, wonderful question you're asking. I, I I say there there's there are Iranians who have been extremely uh, respectful. Uh, there have been Iranians that that actually understood the the value in 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 their Iranian stand up comedians to the point that they went out of their ways to to support us. Um, and there are also Iranians to this day, after decades of us really creating so much uh, wealth, I would say, for the community in 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 the Western world, not just you know Iranians, um, that that has been amazing. Um, so there there are both kinds of pe- there there you know, and and I would say mostly the more educated, the more. Uh, the type of Iranians that understand how societies function and how a community becomes more powerful uh, in the world, in you know, how, you know, is by art. So whether it's stand up or it's it's poetry or you know any uh, uh, filmmakers, any of our artists that do incredibly well, and then they do well in the international. Uh, 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 world, then th- that makes all Iranians more prominent in the world. It it it, sh- it, 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 it you know makes us look so amazing, it, and, and it helps the younger generation. It helps our kids to to grow up with some sort of pride and say, "Hey, there! If this guy can do it, I can do it also," yeah. and they become better than us. So it's so valuable to support your Iranian artist. Any any culture should value their artists uh, beyond words can describe. And and I think a lot of us do. And those who don't, um, a lot of people have gravitated, you know, more towards the Iranian artists. And, and, I, and I'm hoping that this happens more and more, really. We need it. Max, you, you said um, in a, you and I were talking uh, before this interview, and you said that about four or five years ago, 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fast forwarding to the present day now because I know I can't keep you forever, but you said about four or five years ago, you came to the recognition that you needed to, that Max Mini needed to create his own stories. Um, I want to get to what that even means, but, but, but sure. what, what was the precipitant? What happened four or five years ago that led you to this? Well, Hollywood does not give us the chance that we want. That's the truth. We don't get to be a part. We don't get to be part of projects that we want to be, uh, because uh, you know uh, we're 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 just we're. Uh, I'm not looked at the same way as another white you know actor or comedian is. So looked even at, though or, you're a handsome guy with relatively white skin, and you know your name is Max. No, no, really, <laughs> you're not like. I mean, even you don't even. I'm I'm Gion with a nose and a brown skin. You're you even you are still seen as the other, right? Is that what you're saying? I think I, I, I think I got it even tougher, Gian, because I don't even if I looked more Middle Eastern, at least I would have been more eligible for the very Middle Eastern projects that would come out. There was a time that was very difficult for me that I wasn't Middle Eastern enough and I wasn't white enough. So um, the, the the struggle of not being able to get the projects that I want to be a part of made me one day realize, wait a minute, I created my entire stand-up um, comedy uh, persona myself. I gave this to myself. Nobody else made it for me. And I will do the same thing in, 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 in the world of filmmaking. And, and so I started my production company, and I said, I'll make TV show projects and movie projects, anything that I truly believe in, I'll work hard to, to give those projects uh, a start and and take it from there. And so I started my production company and I you know started producing TV shows and, and and movies. Good for you, man. And on that note, you've just finished directing and producing a movie that's called that that's called James the Second. Is it is is this a, is this a yes. feature film? It's a full feature film. Uh, I produced and directed it, and I gave myself a little small part in it. <laughs> so, so how do you, for, first of all, how, I mean, you talked about superpowers earlier, but you've got you've got a lot going on. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're doing your live shows. You've got a, a, a bunch of videos out there. You've got your you've got Das Tavar, which is this great interview show you do. You've got uh, and and you're directing and producing a movie. So, uh, how do you organize your day? Man, I wake up 5.30 in the morning and I go to bed. I pass out anywhere between 10.30 and 11. So um, You really get up at 5.30 every day? Every wow. day, every day, especially now. In the times I was traveling, if I had, you know, when I had gigs, I would try to get, get back and go to sleep as soon as I could. But some nights, obviously, we had later nights and then I would sleep until like 7, 8 o'clock. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm up early. And, and um, I keep a super, super busy schedule. Um, one, of the, one of the most incredible books I've read early on, I think I was in my uh, mid-20s, uh, it was called Time Management by Brian Tracy. I love that book. I, I, I've listened to that book cover to cover maybe, no exaggeration, maybe 50, 60 times. I, I constantly listen to it to, to kind of bring me into this zone of like, uh, where am I? Where am I with my projects? What are my priorities? So, um, you know, managing your time, uh, I think, is is the most important part of your progress and your growth. So, I I like. I'm very ambitious. I I, I want to. You know, I've always been wanting to do a lot, and so when my stand up comedy took off and it became, um, it got to a place where I I write and create. Um, effortlessly, um, and I know how to go about it. Um, with the other uh, hours of the day, I started producing uh, projects that I was very, very passionate about, and that's where these, these the shows that you mentioned came about. And I went to film school. I went to UCLA. I studied, um, uh, you know, uh, this 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 major for for you know for the passion of making telling stories. And um, I it's been it's been a wonderful journey. So, so wait far. a second. I, this is great. I, I'm loving this. Max Amini, 
uh, for, I, I love ambitious people. <laughs> I, 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 well, I mean, I would have to say that because I'm, I'm, I'm an A-type personality, so it's like a form, some form of validation. But this is quite remarkable. 5.30 every morning, you said you go to bed around 10.30 at night. So really, like you don't go out? You, when you're doing those, uh, um, those, those shows and they're like, Max, be a bit, you know, let's have a, she's a kebab bez or whatever. Yeah. You, <laughs> you, you don't go out? You don't like stay up and, and, or you don't go to the comedy store and drink with your buddies on a Tuesday night or whatever? No. Well, I don't drink. I don't drink and I don't, I've never done drugs in my entire life. And you, you don't drink at all? Nothing. Zero. I don't drink wow. at all. Zero. Um, every, yeah, all my friends know this. And, and I, 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 look, I'm pretty disciplined with these things. I do go, it's not like I'm a robot. I, you know, <laughs> let's just say Friday, Saturday, you know, Sundays, you know, but Monday through Friday, I'm in the office. I come to my production company. Um, you know, I'm first to be in the office. I'm the one who leaves after everybody else is gone. Um, you know, I, I travel usually, f you know, during the weekend and during the week, I'm in LA in the office like no matter what happens monday i try to be in my room and if i w at least maybe two three times in a whole year i do a long tour where it's like maybe eight nine twelve days but you know throughout the year i try to stay in town as many days as i can so i can work on the projects so i simultaneously tour and make the tv shows wow i am so i'm so impressed with that level of organization uh, Thanks, brother. Uh, and also, uh, you sound really OCD and annoying. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning. It. So what is what is? Okay. No, it was great. I love it. So what is what is James the Second about? James the Second is a is a script that I I was looking for a comedy script and and I found this drama uh, and. Uh, the movie, the story really resonated with me. It's about a 13-year-old kid that has this condition where he cannot feel pain or emotion. And through uh, puberty, while he's in high, in high school, he there's a girl that falls in love with him. And his this journey shows how love can bring your senses back. It's a beautiful PG-13 movie, and, and I've got some wonderful actors in it. Isaiah Washington is in there, um, Lynn Collins, uh, and, and the two, the two um, kid stars were, were tremendously talented, um, Bryce Gayshore and Ella Anderson. They're, they're both actually very well-known um, uh, actors. And, and the movie t has turned out really nice. I'm very excited to put it out there hopefully soon. Um, we just finished it, so it's a matter of months for it to this come is amazing, out. Amazing, man! I mean, that sounds great. And and you, I, I just want to plug this as well. You've got a new special that's going to be uh, coming out. That's based on a show you did in L.A. last year. Well, we just you know th th throughout the quarantine, I got a chance to um, uh, edit one of my shows. It looks great. It and, and I'm very excited about this show. So we'll see where it lands. There's no promises on the special yet, but the special is cut, and one way or another, I'll find a way to for, you know for it to come out. So I'll, I'll keep everybody posted on social media. Listen, I was watching a. Uh, um, we usually go out on some music. I was watching one of your shows uh, online. And uh, I wouldn't describe myself as a David Bowie fan. I would describe myself as a David Bowie zealot. Okay. Yeah, and, okay. and there you are with a bow with a <laughs> Bowie shirt on, and I'm like, right. this guy, he better know something about Bowie. He better be a fan, <laughs> otherwise he has no business. This Iruni kid running around with this shirt on, right? <laughs> Absolutely true. <laughs> so you are a no, Bowie fan. I, I, I am. I, I, I'm a fan. First of all, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. It wasn't wearing the t-shirt running around. <laughs> He's one of the. He's he's one of the. You know, seriously, he's one of the artists that I actually enjoy his okay. music. Um, but if you want to ask me some trick, no, I don't want to ask your question. Him, I just want to know that you, you like his, his stuff, so we can go out and some both. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. Well, let me tell you also. Let me just say this, and a lot of Iranians could relate to this in Iran. Iranians in Iran listen to more uh, Metallica, Rolling Stone. 
and 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 just you know all these incredible great uh-huh. music that people can even imagine or they know about. They they're so versatile. I music. love so my cousins, I love you know, that you I, got you know? I love that you got Persian there <laughs> and you dropped the you yeah. dropped the S on the Rolling Stones. They listen to yes. Rolling Stone. There we, go. Stone. we go to Starbucks. <laughs> and- <laughs> Yes. Oh, <laughs> that, yeah, goodness. yeah, they do, but they also like the. I don't know. Maybe it's all the people in the diaspora that I know. But the the guys who like in their thirties and forties who grew up in Iran, they they're all guys like Shia who's working on you know the show here. They 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 know like Pink Floyd. They all they know all this like this like techno math rock, you know, atmospheric rock of the 70s and 80s and stuff. And you're like, what? You don't know Jay-Z? And they're like, no, who's Jay-Z? But King Crimson, everyone knows King Crimson. You're like, King Crimson? What are you talking about? You know, like, it's like, <laughs> so there's these, it's all a matter of, I guess, what made it, you got what what came out in the suitcases when they were peddling the music or something. But uh, it's it's always strange. And I, I don't, I don't I, Bowie seems to be, half and half i know a lot of iranians who respect or know the the bowie catalog and and some who really you know aren't as familiar with his incredible legacy but that's my own issue that's amazing buddy you sound like a huge uh music guy and you've got a lot of passion for music of course that's my that's my life listen max you are the best this was so uh uh, you know, there's there's interviews we do sometimes where we go. Oh, I'm probably gonna have to do, edit this thing. I don't, I, there's no edits here. It's just uh, yeah. you are you are uh, so much fun to talk to, and uh, you're so insightful in terms of the way you approach things. Um, to know that you have um, uh, thought this much about what you do, uh, and, and it's just not just raw talent of a handsome guy out there. You know, uh, is really really impressive, and uh, I've I've so enjoyed this and. I'm I'm so grateful for the time you gave us. Thank you, Gian. I enjoyed it as much as you did. It was wonderful. I appreciate your time. I appreciate all the love you put into this. Talk to you soon, man. Let's hope uh, we do it in person when the when the, the COVID is over. I get to see you again. Absolutely, buddy. Absolutely. Take care Absolutely. of yourself. Mizu Thank you. See well, you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Office. Bye-bye. Max Amini. An Iranian-American comedian, actor, producer. He's the head of Abstraction Media. And Max joined us from Los Angeles, California today. This is full time for Rook. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what we do or have ideas of how you can support or have questions or comments, info at rookmedia.com is where to find us. Since we talked about David Bowie, I will never miss a chance to spin some Bowie. And since both Max and I have mothers who are of... Azeri background. How about a little song called Yashasin, Turkish for long live from 1977? Thanks to the Rook team. Mizun Bashin. But I don't want to leave
drift away. Yes.